Howdy. Howdy. Pleasure to be with you here today. But before we start, I have a confession. So I'm a historian by training, a government employee by avocation, and I'm a train enthusiast by addiction. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, when I get into this talk, I get really wrapped up in it because I love what I, I love what I do. I love railroads, I love railroad history. And I apologize in advance for potentially getting into the acronyms or getting a little too fast or maybe skipping over something you're interested in a little too quickly. So what I'd like to propose to you here right at the beginning is that um, if, if that happens and I start running away with it, they uh, raise your hand or give me the high sign or something and get, you know, flag me down uh, and make sure that I'm on the same sheet of music. And also want to give a shout out to someone many of you probably all know, Henry Mayo, uh, local historian, uh, surveyor by trade, by profession. Uh, several of the images that you'll see today were courtesy of Henry. I didn't cite them. He said, don't worry about it. Um, you'll probably imagine the maps are probably Henry's if you know him. Um, he and I did a talk over at the Brazos Valley Museum of Natural History a couple weeks ago. Um, and we kind of tag team this. Now I'm soloing on it, so I'm a little nervous about that part, but I think we'll be all right. All right, so I'm here to talk to you about railroad history in the Brazos Valley yesterday, today. And when I say Brazos Valley, I define that kind of broadly. We're going to get up to Hearn, we're going to get down toward Houston a little bit as well. I want to make sure we're not trying to think of this, well, we're trying to think of this holistically. We're not trying to isolate Bryan College Station because what we do here is very important to what we do elsewhere. So here we go. I mean, just all right. So you got to know the players, right? You got to have the scorecard to know the players. So here we go. First railroad or second railroad through Bryan College Station, the International Great Northern, later became the Missouri Pacific. Okay. Second railroad or the first railroad, excuse me, the Houston and Texas Central, which built the. By the way, the IGN built south from Valley Junction up by Hearn. The h and built north from Houston. We'll talk more about the details in a minute. That later became Southern Pacific. Many of you in this room who lived here prior to 1996 probably remember the Southern Pacific and prior to 1982, the Missouri Pacific. Now, they are all the Union Pacific and those are those big yellow engines you see all the time uh, walk, uh, on your way to work or driving down Welburn Road. All right. This is a map that's probably a little bit hard to read, but I want to kind of explain it to you. I didn't realize my, my laser pointer wouldn't work on the screen. So I'm going to walk over here and shout it out. Houston down here, note it doesn't say Brian. The first line that was built north from Houston was supposed to go to Boonville, which as you all know is about two and a half, three miles to the east of the present site of Brian. So that yellow line represents really the first railroad idea for the Bryan College Station area. This map is even harder to read. This is a Henry map, and I'm going to walk over and explain that one to you as well. This is what actually happened. <clears throat> so this is Brazos County. You probably recognize the shape of it. You see Boonville is here. and. Until I saw this map, I didn't realize the reason Boonville was placed where it was is it's almost geographically right in the center of the county. And that's why the railroad wanted to go there. But the railroad also had other ideas. They wanted to follow a geographically flatter route, which meant following along the valley of the Brazos River. And going overland to the east of it was probably not the smartest and cheapest way to build. So here's Boonville here for reference. Here's what actually happened. You'll see that the railroad is going to actually miss Boonville. And when I, I, I used to be on the Historical Commission in Bryan, and I said, Scott DeLucia actually asked me one day on the radio, what's the most interesting thing you ever found out about the history of this area? And I said, that not only the most interesting thing, but the most insightful thing I ever found out is when the citizens of Boonville realized the railroad was going to bypass their town, they voted to pick up the whole town and carry it to, to Bryan so they could be on the railroad. So even back then, the, the good citizens of Boonville realized that the railroad was critically important to their economic, political, social survival. So this is the actual route. And you notice it's kind of to the southwest of where the original route was. 
And in this, the, blo the boxes, incidentally, are uh, the original Stephen F. Austin land grants. And in each box is the name of the person who received that grant. And if you live in Bryan especially, but also in College Station, a lot of the names on that you're going to recognize as street names uh, because those are the people that developed that space. This little box up here is Bryan, and that was the gift of William J. Bryan to the people of Bryan to build the railroad through that space. I wouldn't, the map that I have <laughs> that Henry provided me of downtown Bryan was just way too complicated to show on a screen. But I can tell you this, that when they partitioned off the city of Bryan, it's at about a 45 degree angle with the different blocks. And uh, every single name on that partition you would recognize from way back in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, because they're all streets today. This is a little simpler map to understand. This is where we are today, and I'm only doing this now for your orientation purposes. You'll see we're down here toward the bottom. This is the IGN is the blue line, the International Great Northern, later Missouri Pacific. The yellow line is the Southern Pacific, or formerly Houston and Texas Central. And the red is what we call towers. And in a previous talk, I had a lot of towers in there, and I think it's too much for y'all. What this is is wherever two railroad, two or more railroads crossed each other, the railroads erected a tower. And in the state of Texas, by law, they were numbered. There's no names, there's no uh, telegraph codes, they're all numbered, and they were just numbered from one counting upwards. So there's no relationship geographically to them. So Tower 7, because the HNTC and the IGN were very early railroads, was the seventh tower constructed in Texas. And that guarded the, the crossing of the IGN and the HNTC right across the street from where Kyle Field is today. Okay, we're going, to we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Tower 36 is right where Grosbeck Street, uh, Finfeather, and South College almost all come together. They're just a little bit north of there, just south of downtown Bryan. And I have some pictures of what this looked like back in the day later on. So there's Kyle Field right there. There's George Bush Drive and where the Mickey D's used to be. And then this is now called Bush Junction or CBQ, in railroad parlance, CPQ078, 78 miles from Houston. That's how they do it. <laughs> and Bush Junction, of course, is named after the, my, the namesake of the library. And then, for reference purposes, up at the top, that's Producers Co-op up there by Highway 21. The line off the top of the screen goes to Hearn. If you drive up Highway 6, you parallel it for a, the part going into Hearn. The line that goes out to the left goes out into the valley. If you drive Highway 50 up through Mumford, that's the line you're going to cross right when you get in to um, Mumford. All right, here we go. This is an old map. This is Kyle Field. This is Tower 7. You can see the proximity. How old is this map? This is where the baseball field was. It was actually between Kyle Field and the railroad tracks back in the day. And everything was on the east side of the railroad. This is today. This is 21, 2154 Welburn Road. This is George Bush Drive. Here's Kyle Field up here. Here's the site of Tower 7. And then this is the Union Pacific right away. You probably remember, I know I do, I moved here in 1990 from New York. You probably remember between the railroad tracks as they exist today and Welburn Road, there were those dirt parking lots right by A&M. That was actually part of the railroad back in the day. Kind of wish they still were parking lots. Here's a better view of that area. Here's Tower 7 down here. There's the baseball field. There's Kyle Field right there. That's old school Kyle Field. There's the field house. Those of you who remember that back in the day. There's two railroads in this picture. This one very much toward the bottom, that's the Missouri Pacific coming in from Navasota. And this one coming in here is the Southern Pacific. They cross right there. So the MP will run on the east side of the SP until they get to Bryan. Then they're going to cross again. I know what you're thinking. Highly inefficient. You would be correct. <laughs> and this area right here, which is right in the vicinity of Old Main now, where they dug the tunnel under Welburn Road, 
This is the station area. The, the stations were within 50 feet of each other. Uh, and you could walk from one to the other very easily. Here's a better blowout view of it. There's a, some fans, several fans in attendance at an A&M football game there. And you can see kind of the lay of the campus. And Brian is way over there on the other side of those trees in the background. And you can see down at the bottom here, there's Tower 7, a little more elaborately built back in the day. And there's almost nothing. There's nothing to the west of the tracks. And there's virtually nothing to the south and east of, the, of um, what is now George Bush Drive. And now there's Tower 7. And that blue circle, incidentally, is the location of the Olson Field today. Yes? What year was this? That year, uh, I don't know. I'm going to say 20, 22. It's, it's a while ago, and it's very early Kyle Field. It's there, but it's in its very earliest form. I hate to say it, but a lot of these pictures don't come with dates, so you have to kind of look for reference points and then look for other photos to match up. So I can't get very exact. And the, you may notice on the blue circle, the right field in Kyle Field is where the railroad used to be. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is, uh, this is for the railroad people in the audience. This is what they call a track chart or a track arrangement chart. What we're do this is George, imagine George Bush Drive is on the right and University Drive is over on the left. What they used to call, old, uh, Welburn Road was called Old State Highway 6 at the time. And so we have Tower 7 right here. Of note, though, there's some yard tracks there. SP Station here, MP Station there. The bell tower would be right about here today. Notice this coming off. The Texas A&M power plant, the, place, the one that's in use today, was powered by coal. And they got coal delivered by the railroad. I got some really interesting photos of how that operation worked later on. I just wanted to give you more of an orientation view of how this worked. That's the original HTC station. How do I know it's original? The Missouri Pacific station is not built yet. And that's, that's old. That's probably 1875, 1876. And you can tell by the style of a railroad locomotive as well. There they are together. You may, you may recognize the design of one of them if you go on University Drive over to the art gallery. That building is patterned after the H&TC station. Here's some action down at the station. And the big question on this photo is, how did the photographer get this angle? Because there was no bridge there. This is actually Franklin Roosevelt getting into his car after debarking from a train. Um, and the train has already departed, but he's getting into his car prior to moving over to the campus. So I can only imagine this was taken from a light airplane or maybe a balloon, because it's certainly too high to be uh, anything else. Here's a three-quarter shot of that area again. Old timers in the room probably know what this building is. Over here, does anyone know what this building is? Kim, you're shaking your head. Yes. What? That was old. Anyone else? It's the creamery. That's right. The A&M Creamery is right there. It was near, close by the station, and we have the SP and the MP. Kyle Field will be on the right side of the uh, screen, and then the baseball field will be just off the bottom of the screen. Here's a more contemporary view. This is about 1957, 58. These are A&M fans getting on a train to go to an away game. They're actually getting on the train on the Southern Pacific. The Missouri Pacific is to the right. Where the tracks are on the upper right corner of that screen is where, Wel Wel where Welburn Road is today. So that gives you a kind of a space. And there's that creamery again poking out from the left, top left part of the image. OK. So we're, let's fast forward to now. Let's talk about the IGN. The, I, where, what happened to it? You know they crossed at Tower 7. Olson Field's there now. So what, what happened? Well, Marion Pugh Drive is what used to be the right-of-way for the IGN. And there it is uh, at George Bush Drive. You, that's why it's so straight and flat. And then headed south near Crompton Park, 
And you could tell that's the right of way right there. I'm looking straight down. And if I turned around 180 degrees, I'd be staring right at Wright Field and Olson Field, and beyond that, right at the side of Tower 7. So there's still a little bit of grading, but not much else of the IGN left. OK, this is fun. This is a contemporary view of University Drive. You probably recognize this as the Northgate area, right? Check this out. That building is the same building in Northgate. Yes, there's a car accident. Ignore that. More importantly, note the railroad tracks. That's the line that was coming in from the station area, wrapping around the north side of campus and going to the power plant over there just north of this photo angle. The, uh, and notice that the uh, University Drive is significantly smaller than it is today. <laughs> OK, now I'm turning around about 90 degrees. That's a contemporary view. That's the post office building for reference. And this is a derailment on that line going in. Notice the proximity of the young man in the front. You will never, ever, ever be able to get that close to a derailment nowadays. No one seems to be paying much attention to him, and he's just there for the photo opportunity. And those guys in the back are wondering who's going to lose their job when they finally get that railroad locomotive back on the track. So this was not without its perils even around the campus itself. You probably recognize that shot, too. This is the construction of the underpass at Welburn and University Drive. Thank God this was built, um, because there's so much train traffic, it would delay it incessantly. Um, that's uh, probably the 1960s that was being done based on the vehicles. Uh, still looks very much like that today, although the interchange itself has changed a lot. You can notice over to the top of the screen, A&M is beginning to grow out that direction. Almost all of that are Quonset huts. They have since been replaced with regular buildings, but this is uh, very much post-war uh, A&M growth. But then there's this. How many people remember the beer train derailment? OK, so there's a, OK. This, what I'm about to say might be an apocryphal story. Might be. The A&M students were very helpful to come out <laughs> and clean up this derailment, OK? I'm just saying. That boxcar is actually specifically designed to transport beer. That's how I know. And then, of course, if you look around, you see all the cans on the ground. And uh, no one was killed, and that's probably the most important takeaway for this, from this scene. This is courtesy of the very excellent City of College Station history webpage. So if you want to see more about this, please check it out. All right. Has anyone ever heard of the Tunerville trolley? Oh, yeah. OK. So all right, let me whisper to you through the microphone again. This may be apocryphal, too, that the, at Union Hill, which is there in the middle, it's right about where Carney's is on um, South College. And you notice there's a hill there. And the Tunerville trolley was very much underpowered for moving that number of people. And frequently, the core guys had to get out of the trolley and push it up that hill. <laughs> and they paid for the privilege. <laughs> you probably have not heard much about this one, the Brian Verisco Inner Urban. So if you want to see some architectural ruins of that, when you're driving out Highway 21, toward Caldwell, and you cross the Little Brazos, look to your right, and you see those piers in the, that's what carried that railroad across the Little Brazos over to what is now Verisco. Actually carried it across the Brazos River, and then they headed south, parallel to what is Highway 50, for about two miles. That was a very short-lived railroad. All right, let's move into Bryan a little bit. I know this is College Station, but they are related. There's Tower 36 in the middle, right here. This is South College, right there. Grows uh, 32nd Street here, and the junction is right here. Tower 36, of course, is long gone, now called Bush Junction. And this is where the IGN and the uh, HNTC recrossed each other, so the IGN could go out into the valley, and the HNTC could go directly to Hearn. Here we are looking at downtown Bryan the way it was back in the day. This is, if you were standing, the courthouse wasn't where it is now, but if you're standing on the roof of the contemporary courthouse looking to the southwest, this is what you would have seen. 
The closest building here um, identified is the freight and passenger station for the SP, right about where the library is now in downtown Bryan. You could tell because the Carnegie Library is still there, and it's there in this picture. Over on the back, in the background, is the Missouri Pacific Station, and that's where Sale Park is right now. That entire space that's occupied by Sale Park was the MP Depot. So they had t four depots within seven miles of each other, and so no one could complain about the transportation in Bryan College Station back in the day. This is a closer shot of the MP Depot, the IGN Depot in Bryan. Beautiful building, and I understand it was there until the 1980s before it was finally demolished by the railroad. And peeking out right in the back there, that's Tower 36. So we're looking almost exactly south on the IGN, and then the SP would be over to the left. Now we're moving a little bit further to the north, and the reason I include what I'm about to tell you is because nothing happens in Bryan College Station unless we look to the north a little bit at Hearn. All right, and for orientation purposes, this is the line that parallels Highway 6, the former Southern Pacific, if you drive to Hearn on Highway 6. This is the SP or the MP line that comes in from the valley. The blue line goes straight up the valley and goes to Waco. This purple line is a, branches off right downtown Hearn. So when you're coming into Hearn and those big fuel tanks are on the right, you go up and over the bridge, that purple line is the line you're crossing over and it goes down and then out toward Giddings. The green line is a former Missouri Pacific line that ran from the border of Mexico through Texarkana to Little Rock and ultimately to Chicago. It was their most important international traffic line, and I, I call it the IGN to Austin. And if you drive down Highway 79 to Austin, you'll parallel that line most of the way and even beyond down to San Antonio. Tower 15 guarded the crossing of the IGN and HTC in Hearn. That's right at where the U cross on Highway 6. If you look to the right, it was right there. And Tower 194 controlled Valley Junction, which is very, very important junction on the Missouri Pacific. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is what you see. This is what the railroaders see in that same map. These are terms that they use to describe the operating territory. Remember that back in the day, they built the railroads from point to point to point, and different communities would build along the railroad. Many of those communities are no longer there. And so as far as the railroad's concerned, they still are. And so there's a lot of names on the railroad that are no longer existing in real life. And so when you look at a railroad map, you may wonder, who is this or why is this? And just reflect back 100, 130 years ago when the railroads were built. Verisco is a good example. That was a very important place on the railroad. Now, we still know where Verisco is, of course. There's a cotton gin there now, but it used to be way more than that back in the day, and they still call that Verisco. Then the CP, CP, by the way, stands for control point, and that is where switches are located, and you can change tracks. And the rest of it's pretty straightforward. Tatsy used to be a community in the valley to the southeast or southwest of Hearn. There's nothing there anymore. Actually, the, the new yard is built on the site of the old Tatsy location. This is an aerial shot of what I just showed you on the map. Tower 15 is that right in the middle of Hearn, right there at the top. That valley junction's down the bottom, and SP, of course, brings you to Bryan College Station below that. This is an interesting image of Valley Junction back probably about 40 years ago. You notice that all four lines are connected together, and this is a very unusual junction because of uh, that very reason. that The railroad moved so much traffic from line to line to line, they felt obliged to connect all of them together. This is Highway 79 down at the lower right, and if you're driving west from Hearn, that first bridge you go up and over, that's right there. This is more of a blowout map, like how we're BCS, we're up in the top right corner. This is what I call, the, well, they call the Somerville map. Somerville is right, right here. And this is the former BN line. This is BNSF now that runs down from Cameron down through Somerville and then all the way down ultimately to Galveston. That line that's going top to uh, bottom left, upper right, that's the line that runs down from Hearn that you cross over when you go into Hearn. 
It's called the Giddings subdivision. It runs down to Giddings and ultimately down to Flatonia. I'm going to move through these quickly because they're hard to see. Now I'll move into more contemporary and more promotional for me. You may recognize that locomotive, and you certainly recognize those two people on the left. Um, back in 2005, I had the privilege of helping put together this locomotive, and it ran around at UP for almost 15 years, promoting the library, promoting George and Barbara Bush, the legacy of President Bush. That's Dick Davidson and his wife. They, at the time, that he was the chairman and CEO of Union Pacific. We dedicated that locomotive. We're actually in a tent that UP built over on the bus ops parking lot on A&M's campus, right by what used to be called the Fred Dollar Building um, on campus. It's right behind that. Here's a, one of my favorite images of the locomotive uh, operating near um, Waco. Uh, several days after that dedication ceremony, we had put together a trip, and Union Pacific had very generously allowed us to use their business car fleet, and we took our guests to Dallas and back, and the UP 4141 piloted that, pro that train for us. Now we're going to get into the technical, and this is where I need you to do this. If, <laughs> I think this is cool. You may not, and you're free to not think it's cool. This is a sort of a quickie tour of how the railroad operates that has nothing to do with trains, really. This is the interlocker at Tower 36 in Bryan, looking south. There's a, you can't see it, but there's a 36 on this building right there. I'm standing in the middle of the IGN right away. Looking down, South College is on my left, and then, um, I, huh? Finfeather. Finfeather. Fin right, and Finfeather will be on the right uh, over there. This is the old configuration. The IGN is proceeding straight. Cutting from left to right is the Southern Pacific coming down from Hearn. The Southern Pacific used to run parallel to Finfeather because, of course, it was on the west side after they crossed over here. It would cross back over to the east side of Tower 7. So here's a shot down the SP with a train. It's not moving, I promise. <laughs> um, I'm actually, if you're probably familiar with that teacher supply building that was painted bright yellow, I'm, it's right behind me in this, in this picture. This is now, they're going to reconfigure this junction to make it more operationally reasonable for the railroad, more, more practical, because UP purchased Missouri Pacific in 1982. They purchased the Southern Pacific in 96. So this is about 2004, the the uh, ish, when they finally got around to organizing this and making it more operationally efficient. So this is how they do it: they build this panel track, they build panel switches, and remember they have to keep operating. They just can't stop all the trains for a week or whatever and start doing this. So everything has to be completely ready to go, and then they create what's called a work window, uh, usually 12, 15 hours and then they just move like gangbusters and get it done. And this is what it looks like. They actually pick up the pieces and they assemble it like a toy. Um, a very big toy and a very heavy toy, but they do assemble it like that. And that's what it looks like when it's been placed in and ready to go. And this is when the, the new signaling has been installed. And this is the first train going on. That whole sequence of photos took about 10 days to get from beginning to middle to end. You can see the line from Hearn coming down and wrapping into the former Missouri Pacific, and he's coming down the former Southern Pacific. He's going to go parallel to Finfeather Road. You can see back in the background for reference the LaSalle Hotel. How do they keep everything straight? You probably have seen this crazy car moving around every once in a while. This is called a track geometry car. And what it is, is it does ultrasound testing of the rails because a lot of what goes wrong on the railroads can't be seen with the human eye. When the steel in the rail becomes brittle and fractures and begins scaling, you can't see that or cracks. And so this car patrols the entire Union Pacific system. Actually, there's several of them. And they do this testing. And there's three crewmen. That's all they do is they travel the system. They live on it. They can cook on it. They have a shower facility on it. And they have all the instrumentation on it. And it's also linked via satellite to the rest of the system. And when they do find what's called a defect, they will identify it with a the place like you place a pin in, G, in Google Maps. They place a pin there. And then the, based on the severity of it, they will either slow or stop traffic until it's fixed. You probably have seen this locomotive come through. This is part of the Union Pacific Steam Program. 
It's the smallest of the steam locomotives. This came through by about 2008. Um, they did a few excursions. This is a uh, Union Pacific, incidentally, is amazing when it comes to doing railroad heritage preservation because this is not an inexpensive operation to do this. And they do it both to promote the company, of course, but also to celebrate their history, which is quite, quite extensive. This is the other locomotive they brought. This is in Hearn, actually, about, I don't know, about 10 years ago. The smaller articulated locomotive. And then this is the big one, the big boy. This is actually a picture of it in service in the mid to late 50s out of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And that's why it looks really crummy, uh, because it was getting to the end of its useful life. This is when they took it in and started tearing it down. And this is what it looks like without the cab on it. I thought that was it. A friend of mine sent me this shot. He was working on the... Uh, project up in Cheyenne. It took about five years to tear this locomotive down and build it from the ground up again. And remember that the expertise to do this and the parts are no longer around. Everything has to be made and everything has to be learned before you can make it. This is a picture, this is back to College Station. The last time it visited College Station in 2019, I'm standing just south of F&B Road where they parked the train that night. And now I'm going to try something that I hope works, may not. This is a picture of the steam engine. This is why it's called a steam engine. Wow. Oh, it gets better. That's the. Ready for takeoff. One thing that they didn't do is toot the horn. I wish they had. It would have been perfect. The gentleman who operates the program and runs, this, runs all the engines, you see, he's up there in the cab. His name is Ed Dickens. Um, he's an absolute rock-solid pro. Um, I don't know how he does it, but he's amazing. The train's going to take off. I won't bore you with all the details, but this is when they donated the 4141 to the library. You probably saw uh, on the news coverage that day. The, let me back up a second. And this is really not, the, this is actually two engines. There's a pair of cylinders in the front, another set in the back. It's an articulated locomotive. The front engine is the front two pair of cylinders. The back engine is the rear two pair of cylinders. So it's really two engines in one. UP was one of the first railroads to pioneer that technology. All right. Whoops. What kind of fuel was it burning in It was originally built as coal, but now it's fired by fuel oil. It's a very special blend and if it comes back this way you'll see that a semi truck follows them around because they that's how they fuel the they do it very dark, in the dark of night. <laughs> I saw it and said what's that? I said that's the fuel truck. <laughs> Don't look. Don't look. Alright so I've gone super fast and talked about a lot of stuff, some of it very quickly, some of it not so quickly. If you want to learn more about any of this or more railroad history, I'm, I was mentioning the bio, I'm president of the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society. It is the oldest railroad history organization in the U.S., 102 years old. We have an annual meeting, we have, an annual, we have a publication, we do it twice a year, plus newsletters. We have a Bush Library construction camera. If you're interested, you can watch live. And I'm just going to share this, by the way. This is a live camera on our new building. You can see the 4141 inside the windows. It's wrapped right now, but you'll be able to watch it be unwrapped when it's. This is the, the big boy. It's coming back. And you can go to this link for the four, it, it's called the Four Corners Tour. It'll be in Texas. 
I don't know the exact timing or if it's actually going to come through Bryan College Station, but they have Dallas and Houston, and to get from Dallas to Houston, you have to come through Bryan College Station. So I'm making an, an assumption there. And then here is the Texas interlocking. I mentioned Tower 7, Tower 36, and all that. If you go to that, it has all the towers from 1 to 236. And so if you grew up in Texas and you, were, you remember just off the top of your head, oh, yeah, I remember that down by, this, by the junction, I guarantee you it will have great historical photos. Some of my photos were from this web I took from this website. It will have some great narrative and often some really excellent first-person accounts. Like, I worked there, I remember going there, and some really fun stories that may spur, spur your memories from back in, in the early days of your your youth, or in my case, misspent youth. So, all right, that was a lot. I understand really quick. Does anyone have any questions? Yes.